There are secrets out there, guys, performance marketing secrets, and knowing just one or two of them can absolutely light up your funnels. Let's go. This is the Revenue Driven CMO. I'm your host, Chris Mechanic. Join me as I uncover the secrets of the world's most elite CMOs marketing leaders. The Revenue Driven CMO is sponsored by Web Mechanics, the AI-driven performance agency that makes you smarter. Hello and welcome everybody to another exciting episode of Revenue Driven CMO. I'm your man, Chris Mechanic. We have got an awesome episode in store for you here today. Our guest is uh, a really innovative, forward-thinking marketing leader, and he's been described by some as mad men mixed with math men. So he's got a really data-driven approach. He spent a lot of time at SAP uh, working closely with the one and only Bill McDermott, who of course is the CEO at ServiceNow. Uh, He was also at Commvault. He's won all types of awards. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Mr. Chris Powell, CMO at Click. Hi, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And look, our our outfits are similar, except like inverse. Like if I Excellent. reversed my vest, it would be the same outfit almost. <laughs> well, I'm super duper excited to jump in. You know how we like to roll. We like to lead with the value punch. So why don't you share with everybody, what is one of your best kept secrets? Like how have you been able to have such a successful mar- career in marketing? You know, I think the... Uh... I often tell people I'm, an, I'm a marketer by accident in, in some ways uh, and in different ways uh, and opportunities have been presented to me. And uh, the secret is uh, really not a big secret, just connecting to the business. Uh, it's amazing some of the situations I've found myself in where just uh, really understanding what are we trying to achieve as a business and making sure marketing is aligned to that. And you know, today, those are the you look at a SaaS organization like ours and it's looking at what is the recurring revenue, uh, what's our net retention rate, how do we reduce churn, all of these things that are just key indicators for the business. We need to just make sure the marketing is connected to it. It's uh, it's a relatively uh, simple formula, uh, but it's one I think sometimes we miss. Uh, you get back to a new corner, you're just talking about the marketing and you're you're missing that connective tissue. Yeah, and I mean, that happens, that happens quite a bit because yeah. as marketers, there's this whole body of marketing knowledge that we need to have. You know, you need to understand how the ad platforms work, how the analytics work. You need to be able to write copy. You know, there's there's yeah. a lot that goes into it, and so the business elements of it can be it, it can be easy to forget about them. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, and especially in scenarios where sometimes, well, there's there's sort of two different types of marketing orgs one where it sounds like where you are where you're really business first marketing second and you're really driving the strategy uh but then the other type is uh whether by choice or you know someone by force kind of relegated to the order taker seat yeah yeah you know the classic like hey here's a new white paper like put a campaign together for it And then the marketer's kind of sitting there like, okay, like it's a good white paper, but like, why this? Why now? Yeah, sure. I mean, and you're right. The, the, it's the old age or age old problem of the, as we go into different organizations and I think, you know, working in tech, it's, it's, it's more prevalent in tech, right? You go in, you're working with folks who don't necessarily have an understanding of where marketing should be fitting into the business. And yeah. I always look at it as it's a business, right? It's the business of marketing. Uh, I usually try to use phrases like when we're talking about the website, you know, what's the job of the website? Uh, a lot of folks are have different opinions and and in tech, of course, it's always, you know, everybody can do marketing. Everybody has an opinion. That's one of the things you have to uh, be comfortable with. Uh, but I look at it in all of the different things that we're doing. What's the job of that thing? What's the job of this webpage? What do we want to accomplish with it? Uh, yeah. And it it tends to change the conversation a bit. Yeah. Now I know from I've got a couple questions for you, but I know from our pre call, uh, you worked a lot with Bill McDermott. One thing you said about him was that he was really good at simplifying things down yeah. to their you know to their uh, most basic parts and into a yeah. simple framework. Is that the extent of the of the framework that you're using? Basically, like, hey, how does marketing connect to recurring revenue? net revenue retention, churn, yeah. or do you have a different framework that you use with your team? Yeah, and and, and then that, that is one of the things that learning from Bill, the, 
the if you can have a framework that everyone can unite around the the details that are within that framework are what's really important but the frame is what gives a unifying way for us to be able to manage the business and to manage the business of marketing and within our organization i look at it through what i refer to as the five growth levers for us and it's how do we grow the brand grow existing customers grow new customers grow partnerships and then grow each other uh so that's the the frame that i put in and i usually when i tell people uh the frame i said that's not unique right every company uh can think of their business as how do we grow brand awareness brand consideration how do we take our existing customers and bring more value to them and grow our relationship with them how do we find new customers how do we make sure our partnerships are uh are our true partnerships ones that we're helping them grow and they're helping us grow and then uh, making sure that the business of marketing uh that we're the best we can be growing each other is a big part uh certainly over the last several years right now the, the revolution of ai and what that's doing uh growing each other is a big piece of of being a marketer today so yeah uh, that that framework is what we build everything around and then it's the details underneath that yeah yeah no i uh, i totally get that and i like it a lot because you're taking something that has hundreds of moving parts between the business itself has hundreds of moving parts the marketing programs have hundreds of moving parts and you're simplifying it down to these five things i'm curious like in a given month or a given quarter do you have some kind of activities or initiatives around each of those five things or is it more like hey guys like this month, this is brand month. Like we're going to, of yeah. course, we're going to do some other stuff, but like the, the focus this month is on brand or is it like each period, there's a little bit of something in, in every category. I think you, you said it in the, in the beginning of this and it's, uh, it's all of those things all, all the time. One of the things that I find most enjoyable about being in this role and being in marketing is there's so many different areas that you're responsible for that are so different from each other. So, you know, I'm in a meeting in the morning talking about the website, a meeting in the afternoon talking about analyst relations, then it's about internal communications, employee communications, and then it's about pipeline and working with sales. There there's so many different areas that we get to flex ourselves into. Yeah. Um you have to be kind of a special kind of crazy to to like this kind of a uh, of a shifting that that you're able to do. But yeah. it's what makes it really exciting from my perspective. So I, I use that framework to make sure that we don't get too crazy in terms of uh, the total chaos that that can result. And, and it keeps us, we should always know, you know, what are the top two, three things in each one of those areas that we're trying to do? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, in the pre-call, I wrote it down because it, um, it uh, made an impact on me. But you said a special type of lunatic. You have to be yeah. a special type of lunatic yeah. to be CMO, uh, which I, I thought was funny. Um, and it is, you know, it's a really varied role. It's almost like, yeah. like there's not a lot of roles that have as much variety as the CMO right. role, except like CEO, you know, CEO yeah. probably has a little bit more variety, but being a CMO is in some ways a lot like running your own company like being the ceo of a small company is a lot like being the cmo it, it really is the you know you mentioned the my history with sap and i spent 15 years uh at sap one of the one of the things i did towards the end of my time there was i went and ran latin american marketing uh and uh and moved with my family down to buenos aires and that's where i really got the bit the bug right it's when uh when you're working for a small, you know, one to two billion dollar operation in a behemoth organization like SAP, you're given tons of autonomy uh, and ways that you can begin to really branch out and you're running your own organization. Uh, that was the first time I really realized how, how enjoyable that was to be into so many different areas instead of just a single area. And, uh, and it's what brought me uh, forward in my career and looking for those kinds of opportunities where you really do, uh, you're closer to the business. You're, you're closer to making decisions that really matter. Yeah. And so I see you were actually, it looks like a pretty accidental marketer. So you've been in sales, you've been in strategy, you've been in planning, performance management. Um, yeah. and it looks like your first CMO gig was at, uh, Commvault at in Commvault, 2014. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
So that's awesome. Special kind of lunatic. I like that. So let's talk about Click a little bit. You've been there for a couple of years. I want to I wanna start on a high note. What are some of the accomplishments, some of the achievements, some of the win stories that you and the team have been able to uh, post on the board that you're most proud of so far? That's great. The, you know, Click is a, uh, it's a really dynamic and interesting organization. We're 30 years old, which is, uh, wow. it's an accomplishment in and of itself. There's not a lot of tech companies that have made it to 30 years. Uh, in the last five years, there's been a tremendous amount of change here. Um, the, uh, and coming on board two years ago, you know, I had a, I had a really interesting conversation with our CEO. Uh, and what he told me, Mike Capone, is that, uh, you know, when I look at product, I know if it's working because I, I have something and I can tell you if it's working or not. I talk to customers. When I look at sales, I can tell you if sales is working because, you know, I can tell you whether or not the revenue numbers are what we need them to be. But when I look at marketing, it seems like I'll, I always talk to marketing and marketing wants to say that everything they're doing is working. And, you know, that's not logical to me. And I, and I, I need a way to be able to really understand what's working, what's not working. And, that was music to my ears, right? That's that is exactly the way I like to run an organization. And the what we've been doing over the last couple of years is putting a lot of that machinery in place so that we really do understand what's working, what's not working, to be able to have that, as you noted, data data driven discussion, right? Let, let let's let's have honest discussions about what's really working, what's not working. Let's make sure that we're focusing our resources in the right way. Um, so when we talk about sort of that five point framework of of driving growth for the organization and then also what's really important for the organization in terms of our key performance indicators that connective tissue within the marketing systems is something that we're super proud of and and building out the right ways for us to understand uh where we should be making investments what investments are working and really defining what that means what what does it mean if a marketing investment is working and having those tough discussions with the business, with our customer success organization, with our sales organization, with our finance organization, you know, and really uh, opening it up and, uh, and having a, a really open and honest discussion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And wow, I didn't realize you guys had been a around for 30 years. And yeah. for everybody uh, listening to the audio, click is spelled Q-L-I-K. Um, yeah. And you're an analytics and data integration company. So yep. I imagine you probably have the baddest of badass dashboards yep. that you're using internally to understand performance and really answer the CEO's questions. Yeah, it um, is. Uh, it's definitely one of the benefits of, of working in an uh, analytics company is you have really great people that can build amazing applications for you to be able to run your business. And 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 we refer to them as applications because they're not um, they go much further than a dashboard. You can really run your business off of it, uh, gain insights, and and do something with that data. And that's that's really at the heart of of how we look at this. Is the you know being able to look at uh, the numbers is certainly very important. But somebody taught me um, pretty early in my career that if you don't know what you would do based on what you're seeing, then you know, you're just sort of playing office, right? So you look at the gauges and understand whether things are where you need them to be or if you need them to change, but you need to know what you're going to do differently, right? Like what if if I'm looking at a number every week, then I should be able to change something uh, and and start to tweak and, and try to make some changes. So what business changes can I make if I'm looking at it every day, every week, every quarter? Uh, so we've tried to build something so that we understand the frequency that we're looking at some of the indicators uh, but what are the actions that we can take in order to be able to impact change on those? So it's very um, it's a very operational mindset, uh, and uh, I'm a big fan of an OKR uh, model to the objectives and key results uh, set up, and really being clear on what we're trying to achieve in the near term uh, that connects back to the longer term goals. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you guys are just killing it. 40,000 customers, yeah. Deloitte, PayPal, Samsung, Lenovo, BP. Yeah. These are not it's, small companies. No, and it's uh, the, you know, and at SAP, we used to, we used to say, you know, there's only 500 companies in the, in the Fortune 500. So it's, uh, we're really proud to be working with so many customers uh, in all different industries, all different 
uh, parts of the world, all segments, uh, the the ways that we can really uh, focus on helping them bring value. And as we've extended our portfolio, you know, we the first 20, 25 years of the company, we were primarily a visual analytics company. That's that's what uh, Click was known for, and it's what we grew up being. And then over the last five years, there's been 10 acquisitions. So you can imagine how exciting that is from a marketing standpoint uh, that has really expanded uh, what we do with our customers and expanded the customer base as well as we brought these different organizations together. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. So uh, just for folks to understand, people that might not be familiar with Click, and for me to understand, is it accurate to say like what you guys do is basically you go into organizations, they have huge amounts of data all dispersed in different places. You suck that all into a data warehouse or a data lake, uh, maybe do some sorts of unification, some sorts of appending of that data, and then mm -hmm. make it available to be queried and visualized into yeah. dashboards. So really the dashboards is like kind of the last step in the process. Is that sort of, I would say of it right? you did. That's pretty good. That's pretty close. Um, the, I think the dashboard in many ways used to be the last step, but there's a bit more now with some of the automation uh, that's put in place and really actually taking an action with the data that you can have systems that are now doing the uh, analytics and making the calculations and then informing uh, an action for an employee or for another system to take. So it um, a lot what a lot of our customers are doing with the data now is trying to, just as you said, they have to, you know, most organizations, I, I usually describe it as the folks who are responsible for the data. When we talk to our customers, um, the it boils down to on the one side of it, just as you said, they have tons of data, a lot of different kinds of data the volume of it, the variety of it, where it's located, it's, it's, it, we all know that's part of the story. Then on the other side of it is they need to get value from it. There's tremendous opportunity to leverage this data and they have to get value from it. Yeah. So how do you go from a lot of data and then getting actual value from it and taking action with it? And there's sort of four things that they always talk to us that they have to get really uh, to do right. First is bringing it all together. That's uh, the integration side of it. Uh, next is making sense of it. You have to, some of it's unstructured. We know in marketing how much of our data is structured, but also a lot of unstructured data. So they have to make sense of it, make sure they can trust it, big piece of it, governance of it, um, and uh, and who has access to it and, and make sure all those things. So once they bring it together, then they have to make sure it's it's in a way that they can use it. And then they have to analyze it is the third step. Uh, and analyzing it using not just traditional methods, but some of the most advanced new methods that are out there. A lot of AI machine learning uh, techniques that are being applied to the data to analyze it. And then the fourth step is to do something with it. And that's the some of the automations that can be done uh, with your data so that you're having your employees take action with it. Um, yeah, that part is really interesting, the automation part. So what's a, what would be an example of that? So I'll, I'll give you a customer example. It's a... I, We've got some really cool customer examples. I'll, I'll use Aramark. It's a, we're, we're outside of Philadelphia. I'll use a great Philadelphia uh, firm. So Aramark does the, um, the food service for prisons, for universities, and also for stadiums. So uh, one of the things that is the driver of profitability uh, in their business is reducing food waste. Uh, it's also sure. just important for so many different reasons. Yeah. Um, they came to us and, and worked to develop a system that is brilliant again in its simplicity. I love, I love ideas that are just brilliant and not, uh, something that just people weren't thinking of. And what they did is they decided that they, they wanted to put together different pieces of data that just were being looked at separately and said, well, what's the, what's happening with food service based on the weather, based on the score of the game? Uh, mm -hmm. And based on what they have in terms of their inventory and brought all of those different pieces together to be able to identify and help the different concession stands. What should they be taking out of the freezer? Should they be taking hamburgers out of the freezer? Do they need to make sure they are ordering more of, of some of the beverages they're offering? All of these different pieces that were really uh, left to individuals uh, around the stadium yeah. were now uh, 
sort of put together in a way that they each have a handheld device that is telling them what to do, telling them to oh, take wow. food out of the freezer, telling them to keep it in the freezer. Um, they were able to reduce food waste by 30% uh, oh at, a, at just a, a, a typical game. And the profitability that they can drive in terms of their business model is huge. The carbon footprint uh, of all of that food that was going to waste is reduced. There's, there's just, it's such a smarter way of doing business. Uh, wow. And it's just using the data in ways that no one had thought of before. That is super slick. As you were describing yeah. that, I was thinking, well, how are they possibly getting this information into yeah. the hands of each concession stand in real time? But that handheld device is sick. Yeah. Like, oh my yeah, it's, goodness. It's cool. It's cool. So 30%. Wow. So when you guys work with clients, is it a type of thing where like you help them get it all set up and then they're the ones that come up with ideas like that, like coupling the weather data, for instance, and the scoring yeah, of the game, yeah. score of the game? Like, was that their idea or do you guys kind of manage your clients through the process and say, hey, I bet the weather, you know, really has a big impact. Like, let's yeah. look at that. The, uh, those are their ideas. Our customers are the ones that are really innovating and trying to figure out ways to innovate with their data. And we enable that. Um, wow. And you enable that by, you know, and, uh, sometimes I talk about if you're a CEO in, in an organization like Aramark, or if you're a CEO in any organization, they're pretty much, they leap over a lot of the things that turn out are really hard to do and get to the, hey, we want to drive more innovation, more value with our data. Yeah. The, it turns out that there's four things that are kind of hard, right? Bringing it all together when you have so much of it, so many different types, it's hard. Making yeah. sense of it, it's hard. Analyzing it is hard. And then serving it up so people can actually do something with it is a difficult problem to solve. So we help our customers really in those areas uh, solve those hard problems that make it possible for them to innovate. Yeah. No, that's really awesome. So... um I am curious, as the name implies, revenue-driven CMO, what uh, go-to-market motions or ad platforms or traffic sources or content types are really driving your revenue engine, would you say? I think from a marketing perspective, I mean, we are we do, it's the, our, our paid investments through our digital channels are a big piece of what's driving traffic for us as we're looking at new sources of revenue and new logos. So um, our our paid investments through the digital channels are the big driver of new logo acquisition for us. And we're tracking that, that LinkedIn on that. mostly? A or lot of it's LinkedIn. LinkedIn uh, it's it's a bit of, uh, of driving uh, some of the display advertising, being smart about where, where we're putting some of those dollars and really connecting with the business again. I, I always talk about connecting back into sales to make sure that what we're generating, the people that we're having come to the site are the people who ultimately will want to have a sales conversation. So we we make sure uh, that we're not just driving up our numbers on a, something like our website, but then ultimately that's not resulting in uh, in revenue for us. So yeah, um, so a lot of our digital investment, and then you know with a with an install base of forty thousand customers. Much of what we do also is just that direct engagement with the customers, uh, our field marketing teams, what they're doing, and then working with sales. I'm, I'm a huge supporter and fan of things like social selling uh, and helping our sales organization understand what are the most modern ways to be able to connect uh, with an organization within your existing customers. The, the cross-sell motion for a company like ours, when you bring so many uh pieces of technology together and you're and you were acquisitive as we've been over the last uh, five years that cross-sale motion is critical that's that's why you do it you're looking to bring more value and have more revenue opportunities with your customers uh so so working not just within what marketing is doing directly and some of the things we're doing and things like linkedin but then helping sales also drive that yeah no that's brilliant um what are I mean, it sounds like you guys are doing great overall. I'm just looking at the Gartner Magic Quadrant, by the way, and congrats mm -hmm. on on uh, arriving in that leaders uh, quadrant. Thanks. Uh, in 2023, for the 13th year in a row, it looks like. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. impressive. Yeah, it's uh, the we we now are a leader across three Magic Quadrants, uh, which is an amazing uh, thing to be able to say. I think a lot of organizations 
you know, these have become almost buzzwords. You talk about a platform and all of the things that every every tech company seems to want to be talking about how they're a platform. I right. look at it a little bit differently. I think you need to be able to do uh, when you're working with an organization that's trying to leverage its data. Uh, they're looking for organizations who do several things really well, uh, and that's what we're we're built to do. We help them in areas that there are really big challenges for them. So leading in integration, leading in data quality and that governance side, and then leading in analytics is what we've been able to build and build technology that really helps our customers. Yeah, no, that's amazing. So what are some of the big challenges that you're facing right now? Like what's keeping you up at night? A lot of stuff always keeps me up at night. I'm uh, I'm one of those people that that is always looking for what didn't go as well as maybe we wanted to go and and looks at the through that through those eyes i think i drive everyone who works with me crazy uh yeah. from that perspective because i'm always sort of poking at the at things i i think what what's probably keeping me up at night as we're uh right now in some of the areas that we're focused on is really introducing what is a new click uh to the world when we we have a much broader offering uh and understanding who the who we need to speak with you know what that target audience is the different personas the organization spent 25 plus years uh really selling one product to one primary type of of um of customer and now we have a multitude of products that we're looking to introduce into a customer so telling that story you know how what's the best way to tell that story make sure we're driving our brand recognition not just in what we're core and known for uh, but really bringing that click master brand across the breadth of the offerings that we have today. So that's, it's a fun and exciting challenge. Uh, but you know, the wheels are constantly turning on what's the, what's the best way to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have any, uh, hypotheses or any tests in market? Like, is it. Yeah, we're, 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 or... we're at the thick of it right now. Uh, yeah. testing some messaging, testing some new messaging that we want to introduced at the beginning of next year. And, uh, and I think it's going really well. Uh, it's, we're excited about some of the reception that we're getting from it. And, uh, and the, the premise that I always have, and, and this came from, I, I, I talked to a CIO, gosh, this is probably, you know, eight, eight ish years ago. And what she said to me is stuck with me. And it was just talk to me like I'm your friends, you know, be, be real. Like, and, uh, I think that there's there's so many organizations that the message that they're trying to get out, it uh, I always, you know, people call it, you know, it sounds too markety. I always usually try to say it sounds too salesy, so that's not offensive to marketing. Um, mm. But it's, you know, you just have to be real. Uh, customers are looking for honest solutions. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to work in a company that has great solutions. So in you know, when you're in tech, you want to work with a company that has great tech. We've got great tech. Um, we have the luxury of being able to be honest. You know, we can just talk about the where we really bring value for our customers, give examples of where we bring that value, uh, and then just work to make sure that we're having the the right conversations and we're doing it in a uh, in a language that people understand and that it resonates with them. Yeah, and that I mean that's definitely a difficult challenge. Are you more so interested in reintroducing Click to the install base and the folks that already are familiar with you and think mm -hmm. of you as that as that one product company, or are you more so interested in like the net new, you know, folks that yeah. may not have heard of you? That yeah, I, I mean, I guess the it's a bit of a cop out answer, right? But it's both. Um, yeah. If if we had to choose one versus another, it's really our existing customers that so we want to make sure are fully aware of the offering this, you know, this happened, I joined SAP in 2000. Um, SAP had never made any acquisitions at that time. And it was over my, the course of time I spent there that they became very acquisitive and, and bring people together, uh, bring different organizations together. Uh, I remember we were, uh, I was in a meeting and it was with Bill McDermott where a customer was talking about a solution that they were looking to purchase. Um, and it was in an area that we had made a very large acquisition a couple of years before, and that customer had no idea that we were even in the space. And yeah. it is one of the most difficult things. You, you live in this, right? You you think that everyone is is uh, tuned in as much as you are, uh, and it it turns out it's it's 
difficult to get people to really understand the breadth of what you're doing as you're looking to expand that. So, so our existing customers are really key. Uh, and then the great challenge of making sure that the Click brand is known uh, for a broad set of offerings. And we just made an acquisition of a company called Talon just in the last six months, uh, making sure that we're we're getting all of the brand equity from from that brand as we're bringing our brands together is a is a really important piece of what yeah. we're. Do you plan on merging the two sites or operating them separately for a while? Uh, totally coming together. Uh, it's still a process. We're still uh, sort of completing a lot of the integration work that needs to happen, but we'll be completely bringing them together. And I think the 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 work we're doing now is really understanding uh, how do you bring different brand names together and 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 merge that and the. What leads that is the business and the product side of the business as well, and understanding the reality of how do they see the product portfolio evolving over time, and then making sure that we have the right brand messaging and the right brand architecture to support it. Yeah, that is that is a difficult challenge, like to merge or not to merge, how to merge. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I can, uh, and I'm just doing a little uh, googling here. So it looks like when I Google Talent. Um, I see, I do see a paid ad. I do see an organic listing. You're number one in both. Um, yep. The paid ad currently goes, I didn't click on it. Don't worry. But it currently <laughs> goes to a click.com, to a click.com landing page. So I see you're, yep. you're right, right in the midst of it there. Yeah, completely. The, you know, we, we want to ensure that it, from a customer first kind of mindset and, a, and an audience first mindset, we want to make sure we're not confusing anyone. Uh, yeah. We want to uh, do this gradually over time. You know, the the folks who aren't as as close to it as as folks like us us are, I think sometimes they think, well, we you, we'll just shut down that website and you know we'll bring this all together. But you shut down a website and now that traffic is uh, doesn't know where where to go anymore. And you you need to sort of do this over time. Do it very thoughtfully uh, and making sure that the people who are still trying to find talent because they know talent and a lot of their existing customers, as much as we may want to say, oh, everybody, every, all talent's customers knows about the acquisition. The reality is not, not all of them do, and we don't want them to get lost. Uh, so bringing that along a journey is something that we're trying to do with speed, but just be really thoughtful about it. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense, man. Well, you guys seem to be doing an excellent job. I'm really impressed with what I'm seeing here. Uh, it looks like an awesome um product suite that you now have and um yeah watch out watch I, I'm, yeah. I'm feeling bad for your competitors here for a minute it's it's a good time to be in the data business right it sure is yeah it sure is cool well uh i know you got probably a busy day ahead of you i don't want to take up your uh too much of your time uh but thank you for coming on this has been really really fun and inspiring and educational for me uh, for everybody listening, if you have learned something here today or if you laughed a little bit, drop us a like or a comment or a five-star rating. We always appreciate that. Um, Chris, let us do the lightning round. All right. Ready? I'm ready. Cool. Question number one. If you were to start a side hustle, what side hustle would that be? I've been thinking about this a lot. And you know, my my unserious answer is, I love a good prank. So, you know, I can be a prank consultant of some sort. I love helping people uh, do different things like that. And I nice. I have another friend that uh, started a, a scissor business uh, of all things and uh, sort of curating scissors from around the world. And I'm a freak about pencils. I'm kind of a pencil freak. People who know me. So maybe I'll start a, a pencil business. That's awesome. <laughs> Dude, imagine, imagine an AI prank generator, right? Like there's a few boxes. This is it's it, like, Chris. We can know, do this. You describe your situation, right? Like where are you going to be physically? How are you related to this person that you're pranking? And then like two other sentences of context and just <laughs> limitless ideas. Love it. Um, Yeah, there could be like, how shocking or offensive do you want this to be on a scale of one to 10? <laughs> yeah, how upset do you want the person to be? I've I've uh, I have some people that uh, that I still are wondering if they're talking to me. <laughs> That's funny. Um, cool. Question number two is top three books or 
authors, influencers, podcasts, uh, or other information sources that have made an impact on your career? So, you know, I, um, the one thing that I always go back to is measuring what's, what's working. And there's a great book by John Doerr that is the measure what matters. And it's the whole it's sort of the OKR Bob Bible that's out there. So that's been a big influence for me. Another piece of, um, uh, David Ocker from uh, Stanford is uh, a marketing professor that I just have tons of respect for. He's written a bunch of books. There was one that's come out in the last year that's called uh, The Future of uh, Purpose-Driven Branding. And mm. uh, that's a big piece of what Click's about that that I didn't really mention, but the you know Click is working with over 300 nonprofits in, wow. uh, in helping with, with just a huge array of things that are happening all over the world. So, so that book uh, with David Ocker is, is really something I'm looking forward to listening to. I, I, I tend to do a lot of audibles um, in terms of the the books. And then yep. the, yeah, um, the podcast that I listen to all the time is Reed Hoffman has the masters of scales podcast uh, mm -hmm. masters of scale and uh, the guests that he brings on. I'm always looking for insights from outside our industry and, and what kind of learnings I can apply to it. And, and his guests never fail. Awesome. Very cool. I'll check that out for sure. And question number three is how do you avoid burnout and how do you help your team also to avoid burnout? I, I think I kind of hit on it with the with the prank thing in, in some ways, and it's just keeping it light uh, and yeah. and making sure that we all keep things within perspective. You know, there's there's uh, there's a lot of really important and serious things happening all over the world and and what we're doing while important. Uh, we can keep it in perspective, and and then you know, outside of that, I'm uh, I'm sort of a an, an amateur uh, at anything athletic. So getting out on my mountain bike, I do uh, triathlons that uh, that just give me an opportunity to go out and uh, remind myself that I'm not very athletic, but I'm willing to be in the games. So keeps my head in the right place. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. Very cool, Chris. Well, thank you again. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of people listening to this will want to learn more about you and more about Click. Where would you direct them? Great. Well, you can go to click.com or click.org to hear about some of the things we're doing from a, a uh, overall societal standpoint. Oh, very cool. Yeah. And just again, that is uh, click with a Q. So Q-L-I-K.com or Q-L-I-K.org. Um, I'm going to check out the .org thing because I think purposeful brands and purpose-driven brands yeah. um, are very powerful. So I'm going to check out what you guys are doing there. Awesome. But, um, but this has been fun. Stay on the line for just one second. We'll wrap up. And for everybody else, this has been another awesome episode of Revenue Driven CMO, and we'll see you next time. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us here today. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at RevenueDrivenCMO.com. That's RevenueDrivenCMO.com. And hey, exclusive for listeners of this podcast, Web Mechanics will do 10 to 20 hours of work for you for free. Literally no sales calls, no BS. Just give them a problem and they will put a team to work for you for free for 10 to 20 hours. Even if you're already a client, if you're struggling with demand gen, lead gen, SEO, SEM, Google ads, LinkedIn ads, conversion optimization, if you can't get Facebook or meta ads to work for the life of you, or you can't figure out attribution, web mechanics will take a good hard look at whatever problem you give them, whatever programs you put in front of them, and they will give you an objective informed opinion, plus some advice from 10 to 20 hours of senior level attention. And that's just because you're a listener of this podcast. So I would suggest take them up on this offer. It's ridiculous. Go to revenuedrivencmo.com slash free, fill out the two minute form and you will not regret it. Literally zero downside, unlimited potential for growth. So do yourself a favor, revenuedrivencmo.com slash free, no hyphens, no punctuations. You will be happy about that decision.